we're going to talk about Birth Gap, the documentary film. Um, what what did you think of it, Raymond? Well, I've only seen the first half of it, um, but it was good. Uh, I think that this is going to be a real a real uh, thing that's going to be in the news and you know really bothering us as a civilization in the next two decades, probably. I think it's already kind of a come into the into the um, geist in the past few years, right? I hear I hear a good bit about it nowadays, but I feel like it's going to be more and more a thing when we start responding to it with like different sorts of technologies and stuff like that. It's going to be crazy. It's very interesting because, I mean, at least for part of my life, and if you look at the general like kind of zeitgeist thought going back to the 70s and probably before, to be honest, the, the general consensus was that pop, like overpopulation was going to be the problem. Yeah. Um, as you know, as we kind of reach 9 billion people on planet Earth, that was always the thing is that you know, there's not going to be enough resources for all these people. There's going to be way too many people and, you know, environmental disasters are going to cause, you know, massive res- refugee crises. And this film and kind of the thesis of the film is kind of in, in opposition to that is is it doesn't it doesn't go against the um you know the idea that the population is increasing is going to go up to 9 billion and it got to 10 billion but kind of what the film is warning about is what comes what comes after that is that it's going to kind of taper off at 10 billion not because of anything to do with resources or anything like that, but well, maybe as a secondhand result of re- lack of resources, something like that, but as a result of the fact that there are more, more childless people, more childless women specifically, is kind of what the thesis of the film is. It's kind of a crisis in um, repletion, like how we like biologically uh, replace those who die with living people. Right. Like it's not like everyone's going to suddenly die. It's like the older it, it, it's almost more of a problem of like an aging demographic than it is of like a shrinking demographic. But obviously that will eventually turn into a shrinking demographic. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's like, yeah, it's like it's like I, it, there's one part in the film where this guy has um, he's like a scientist that's been studying this stuff and he has like building blocks and he kind of describes like how um, generational like. The, the old people are basically replaced by newborn people and how that kind of cycle goes and like how we're going as a society there's like much much more like like the old people block is like really fat and long and big and then as time goes by the the the, the younger people get skinnier and skinnier and skinnier mm-hmm. um so then obviously that's going to lead to like a lot of problems with like who's going to take care of all these old people and like are we just going to be a society which is basically a giant retirement home and so on <laughs> yeah i mean like traditionally um population pyramids have been very wide wide at the bottom and smaller and smaller as they go up now mm. this is kind of you know traditionally as a result of the fact that um you know people people have lots of children and they die off as they get older right and this is obviously you know in places that have a higher infant mortality and those sorts of things this is you know more pronounced but as um you know medical technology has gotten better um, life expectancies got longer, that um, pyramid of the population has kind of turned into more of a tower. And what this, the thesis of this film is saying is that in the future, it's going to go the opposite direction where it's going to be an upside down pyramid and you're going to have uh, much more elderly people and much less younger people. Um, and I suppose it's like, well, the question is like population stable, why is, why is that an issue? Um, well, you know, elderly people are not productive in the same way that infants aren't productive in a, in a lot of cases, or at least traditionally that was the case. Um, I think one of the interesting kind of, um, one of the kind of knee-jerk reactions people can have to this is like, oh my God, like, there's not gonna be enough people to do all the work. There's uh, not gonna be enough taxpayers to pay the social security. Um, and I suppose that's what you could sort of think if you have a lack of imagination, um, I think what's more likely to happen is that people are going to have to adjust their expectations about retirement 
people are going to have to uh, adjust their expectations about the standard of living. Um, and people are going to have to uh, adjust their expectations about what they um, expect to receive from the rest of society. Yeah, and also, like, you know, what does actually Fukuyama's uh, book, Our post the Future, go goes into this a little bit in one section. He, he, he asked, like, what would a society look like as like a voting demographic if everyone was like, was like the majority was old people? As, like, as a what kind of, sorry? Like um, voting, like vote, vote, okay. voting, mm -hmm. voting in politicians, like just take that as an example, like what kind of strange, you know what I mean? Like, like it, it, you know, like Trump kind of has a, for example, has like this idea of like building Trump towers. He's going to build factories and, and so on. But like, if you had like, if you had this kind of dystopian situation in the future full of old people, it wouldn't be like building bingo halls and like retirement homes. And like, you know what I mean, like what would the politics look like? You know, like what, how would you be enticing people to voting for you? It, it's almost kind of like absurd to even think about that, right? Like, And also, just as, as I don't know, um, you already see this changing. Like, I think the COVID response mechanisms were already largely geared towards old, older people because obviously the disease was worse for old people, but also because the older people already own most of the assets and they vote more consistently than young people. So we're already kind of, I think, experiencing this society of the elderly, e even though the demographics haven't quite shifted in that, like, uh, uh, mathematical sense, it's already kind of culturally, I think, politically um, shifted over the past few decades. Mm -hmm. And yeah, this is this is. I mean, the current middle-aged people, I guess, Gen X, right? Gen X to um, we've, like you said, we've already seen in the last couple of years that they're perfect as they sit on most of the assets, or they sit on a lot of assets. They're perfectly happy to sit indoors. They're perfectly happy to stunt the development of uh, children. Um, they're perfectly <laughs> happy to um, put other people's life on hold now that they've lived theirs. I think that mm. that level of um, deferred selfishness through the ballot box is not going to change as they get older. I, 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 I think that this um that segment of the population will continue to vote well we'll, we'll actually vote for um more gibbs basically <laughs> so he's a uh, he's a kind of slang thing term they will vote for the government to have ever increasing power and to, to take care of them basically but what that will result in was will result in a debasement of the actual productivity of society and therefore um the actual purchasing power of um the economics basically and it will be essentially a race to the bottom, I feel, into some sort of, you know, pub-driven socialist hellhole, basically. It's 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 a fascinating topic where, like, you, you, it doesn't seem immediately catastrophic, and it doesn't seem, you know, it, it seems a bit, like, unusual. Like, it would be kind of weird, wouldn't it, if, if the average age in a society was, like, 60. Um, but then when you start to think about the consequences, all of a sudden it's, like, Oh my God, <laughs> like, what could happen, you know? This is the really interesting thing is that, like I, like I was saying, like the, the demographics are still, like the population is going to increase for project, projected until like um, 2100 or 2100, however you want to pronounce it. Um, and it's going to get up to around 10 billion. So it's going to keep increasing. And like from, from the, on the surface, that looks like, well, you know, the population explosion and the thesis is going to be true. Um, but obviously the long-term effects of that are going to take a while to sink in. And, um, you know, a lot of that, that 10 billion people society in basically the entire world, apart from sub-Saharan Africa, is going to be a world where um, they're selling more adult diapers than they are um, child diapers. And I, th I don't, don't know what you put this down to, because another... A similar um, time pref like a, a a time preference happened with the COVID stuff because 
I mentioned childhood development, and it's very clear from the literature that if a, a child becomes um, socially and psychologically stunted at young age, it's very unlikely to impossible that they will catch up because they need to be, um, human beings need to be socialized among their peers. Um, and the thing is, right, you know, this isn't immediately obvious, um, but in the long term, the, you know, um, the antisocial aspects of that are going to be very clear in that demo, in that, in that segment of society that had to go through that, basically, I, I think, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was, did you watch all the, sorry, did you watch all the documentaries? There were two halves, right? I, I didn't. And I'll, I'll tell you why, because I, I looked at, basically there's a paywall for the full version if people don't know. I think you get the gist of it from part one, to be honest. I don't know what else they're hiding in the other parts. Yeah, I thought it was pretty, like, I was pretty, like, I was thinking, is there any, is there anything even worse that they can show us? <laughs> yeah, sure, like, sure. But I, I don't um, actually, just to talk about this specifically, I understand, you know, it's a big effort to put a film together, all that sort of stuff. But I was thinking that, oh, I'll just pay for one month on their website because they have a subscription thing and I'll watch yeah. the other parts and then cancel that. But you have to pay for the annual subscription to get, the other parts annual oh fuck that yeah, yeah. so i wasn't i wasn't gonna shout out that amount of money. well we don't need like it's 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 i feel like you did it just from part one i do wonder what that is. It, it, it was like a 40 minute part one as well it wasn't like 10 to 15 minutes so it was it was decent but um i'm i'm i mean you know so like if you take the things you were saying earlier about the kind of like lack of consideration i like i'm increasingly kind of thinking about this for some reason but there's lack of consideration of the future generations like you can just postpone their development and their learning for a few years because it suits you and so on we don't mind working from home we don't want to catch a virus and so on and there's very little consideration kind of politically and socially being and ethically being put into the future generations i also think just to be a big reactionary about stuff this is a little bit not just the demographics and the and, and the economics um or the technology of medical technology but it's somewhat an, an inevitable result of like individualism and the loss of legacy so for example like 200 300 400 years ago human identity especially in a kind of in a kind of patriarchal or kind of pat pat uh, patrilineal sense would think about their grandfather their grandfather and then what they're going to pass on and then they would, they, you know, they kind of have this like sense of identity, which is like in between like multiple, multiple generations in front of them and behind them. And I think that, you know, like after world, after World War II, it was basically like a complete um, destruction of that sort of long-term thinking and that kind of intergenerational thinking. And, uh, you know, we often talk about like people being individualistic from each other, from their community, but there's also a kind of individualism, I think, from ancestry or an individualism from, you know, people that are, that are going to be coming, you know, 100 years from now and so on. So I definitely think that like that, we're like we're kind of ideologically primed, I think, to 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 uh, not think about the consequences of this stuff as well. Yeah, I think I think the, the timings is an interesting point to raise, actually. Because it's one of the kind of mysteries of this documentary is that no one has a really good answer for why this is happening. And just to kind of restate one of the theses of the documentary, it's not that people are having less children. It's that there are more childless women going from like one in 20 to like one in three in countries like Italy, for example. Um, whereas people who do actually have children are... When, once they actually cross that barrier of having at least one child, they still have the same amount of children. Like there's yeah. very few one ch child families. There's lots of two, three and four and above. Um, but it's it's the, it's those childless women that are um, causing this collapse. But so, and then, so that phenomenon um, started happening most places around the early 1970s. You bring up um, kind of World War II and its consequences. And I think they are, relevant in an ideological sense um but like even in the soviet union even in you no know, germany directly after world war ii when you know you're in a, a nightmare this so like kind of um you know catastrophe scenario 
Um, Germany was still above replacement rate for all that all those decades. Um, it's only in the 1970s when we start to see this um, increase in childless women. I just kind of I got some I got some theories on ideas on why this might be. I don't know. What do you kind of think about what the the reason might be? Charles, well, you go first because I haven't really I haven't really thought about it. I mean, like I would I would assume the usual things. It's like too much emphasis on career. Um, I think there's a lot of problems with dating. I don't think the modern dating system works in any way. I like I think it's terrible for getting people to meet each other, like app dating apps and stuff. So so that's gonna but that's gonna inhibit people meeting each other. That's gonna inhibit people then eventually having kids. So, but you know what I mean? I don't have any like crazy hot takes on it. It'd be kind of common sense stuff. But what do you Yeah, think? I mean, I'm not saying it's not a factor, but we have to be really like clear about when this happened because it was in the early 1970s for whatever reason. Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, which is why I'm like, well, you know, dating apps, the way dating, dating, whatever that is, um, happens now, whether it's through apps or whatever, is a, probably a factor, right? But they didn't have Tinder in 1974. Um, no. <laughs> but this is when they interview these women, these um, women who are decided not to have families in the films or are <laughs> involuntary not having families, is that that whole career thing does come up quite a lot. And yeah. I think it's like a massive psyop. I don't think that, I think even people yeah. who say they're career focused and, you know, enjoy their career or, and it's, it's weird because people are saying, oh, I'm focusing on my career as if there's, you're not quite at the destination, but you're one day going to get to this destination. I think it's just a like a huge psyop because I, I think that most people don't have careers. Most people have jobs. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, they do, it's, I, I don't, and I, I'm trying to hold back any sort of like, sexism or whatever um, <laughs> but it feels like it feels like a very you can strange... let it out because we're trying to save the world we're trying to repopulate the world we're trying to repopulate the world. <laughs> but this is this is tight actually but it ties in there's two sides of this coin i can't just be <laughs> sexist the whole time there's two sides of this coin let me get there um mm. i do think it kind of i think it's like a weird excuse because i think this has been true for like all of human history there is never a good time to have a child right yeah it's you know for a woman it's debilitating uh for a man not so much and depending on you know whether you're going to stick around or not it's going to be either more or less of a resource drain on you but there's never like a good time there's probably like better or worse times right and you know this is you know it's kind of a trite and kind of cliche thing to say but like the the chances of like you and me existing right now you know for however tens of thousands of years, like the sperm that was our ancestors kind of winning that race and then being successful, viable offspring. It's like incalculable. Like the chances of that happening are so slim. And, you know, humans have always struggled through things like, you know, child rearing, childbirth. But it's, there seems to, there seems to be like some, some sort of willing suicide here and it's but it's really it strange because a lot of the women they interview in the um documentary who are either voluntary or involuntarily um childless they do kind of bring up the kind of lack of viable um men and i think that there's a lot kind of contained within that like emotionally and what have you but i and this is kind of one of my theories is that I think the vitality of men has been largely sapped by the social acceptance, the personal moral acceptance and the um, proliferation and increasing, yeah, the increasing proliferation of pornography. I think that's the male side of the coin. I think that's the male problem. Of pornography, is it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I agree. I think that like, it's a kind of like feminism, it, like, in this sense especially like the, especially the, the kind of later stages of it really seems to me to be caught into this kind of self-defeating tr like self-defeating trap because on one hand it's like very much a part of a um uh, uh, uh you know a a, a a ideology which is about you know personal liberation and so on which is a part of pornography i always say like 
fe- like like pornography is itself i think a kind of feminist um um uh, symptom because because it's 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 you know it's it's built on a kind of liberal um contractual morality like oh this person's an adult they can film this stuff and do this stuff and you can consume this media and what's the problem like this is the kind of general liberal ethos uh, adults rational adults can make their own decisions and so on um and if you were to suggest this yeah but anyway the point is that i think and and i think that you know obviously um economically uh you know moving away from industrial to post-industrial societies and so on and lots of different developments um have largely i think feminized men and like made and i don't i don't mean a feminized like even in the sense of like um uh, uh like 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 camp or like gay or girly or something i mean like um even today i tweeted out something because i sometimes follow some people on like the far right on twitter and stuff so um i was just like saw somebody was posting up now I know I say this as a bald man, so I, maybe I sound resentful. But he was posting up like statistics of like ball premature balding, and I was just like, and I, mm-hmm. I I'd seen this guy, <laughs> I'd seen this guy before like tweet about like what should you wear sun cream or not, and I'm like, bro, you're trying to present yourself as this like leader of like you know vitalistic traditional masculinity, and you're you're giving guys like health tips, like it's it's pervasive, you know what I mean? Like the the kind of androgenization of human beings today is just. I don't think people realize how bad it is and like how bad it's gotten. Um, so I think in that sense that there's been a, a obviously a lack of vitality and a lack of attraction going on there. And I think that like the more it's encouraged because it's because it's you know it's equal and it's uh, it's it's it's, it's progress, like the less and less people are fucking what want to be with each other basically. So I think that 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 um that is a major factor. There was another point I was going to make um, about oh that was it yeah that was it that i also get the impression now i don't know if this is 100 percent relevant to like our generation or younger but i do get the impression that for the boomers and that for the gen xers that this was a big factor it was that they were kind of given this illusion that you can postpone child rearing indefinitely because medical technology will mean that you can have a kid when you're fucking 60 or something you know what i mean Mm -hmm. so you'll have these celebrities that are that are like how, oh, like you know, Jennifer Aniston's like fifty, and she just had a kid. And it's like, do you realize the amount of like money and like bi- like biotechnology and like maybe surrogates? <laughs> and, like you know, like that's true. Like a lot you know? of so they talk to some fertility doctors in the documentary, and one of them's the fertility yeah. doctor to Kim Kardashian, right? And I don't know, she's yeah. forty something, right? Right, probably. Yeah, I'm not. Right. <laughs> he, but he's saying that, what one of the doctors at least says that. It's a complete like false idea to give women that, you know, that that's a commonly viable or even desirable thing. Because a lot of them have surrogate, like they have surrogate eggs or they've frozen their embryos. So it's either very expensive or it's something that's been thought out before time. Um, And again, like, unfortunately for women, you're most viable when you're around 20. And that there is an exponential drop off in the number of eggs viable eggs your body will produce every like every year pretty much from there men we're, we're simple <laughs> simple contraptions you know it doesn't work yeah. quite the same way but there is but like yeah, when you bring of- this up though it, it like you meet because i have briefly like okay i would say like i was talking to a friend like an old friend a girl like um i don't know it was about two years ago or something so you're talking to someone like in their late 20s and uh, uh i can't remember what it was i was just saying about dating because what happened was this okay this, this is what happened i remember now um I, someone asked me would you date a woman like five years older than you or something like that and this is when i this is when i was like 27 28 and i was like no because she'd be really pushing that kids and i'm not ready for that so i would date i would date down probably and then and then she got kind of offended by that and she was like this is so sexist man just to the and I was like, look, it's like, like the problem with this as well is, is like, you see this um, resentment of the, of like biological uh, time constraints that like have just been imposed on us by like nature and like no one's chosen this and so on. Like, like no one's even um, uh, like, you know, it, this isn't a political decision. And I, 
and I, I, and I think that resentment also comes out of like the 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 kind of promise of technological progress that 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 and again it kind of fits the androgenization thing. So like men can have kids way 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 older, and it's, it's not a big deal, right? But technology kind of promises. Well, we can fix that. Like we can let you have a kid when you're fucking fifty two. Why not? <laughs> and it's just like okay, let's try that. And like what happens? No, it doesn't work. You know so. Yeah, and the the resentment of nature thing has its um, has its manifestations on the the male side of things as well. I mean, you mentioned, and it, you mentioned like the whole um, mm. men being very anxious about being balding and that sort of stuff. It's, yeah. like, <laughs> it's well, it's like, and I don't know, man. If you go on public transport in any like large metropolitan area, you will see so many adverts for like hair transplants and these sorts of things. You will see as many for hair transplants as you will for fertility clinics. Um, mm -hmm. And people completely forget the fact that, you know, I'm pretty sure that, well, like the fact that you're bald is not the main reason why you're not, you can't find a viable mate, like. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure- men have been getting laid throughout all of history. Like it's- yeah, yeah. I mean, now. like, yeah, exactly. Like uh, fucking Caesar went bald early. So don't tell me, <laughs> but anyway. Uh, I, I okay. I, I say this is a bald person, so this this is going to seem like subjective, <laughs> but 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 I'm pretty sure also balding is 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 a sign of if you bald early, it's a sign of testosterone. It's like it's like an it's like a, an exaggeration of testosterone. Um, so it's like even on like on like a kind of bio psychological evolutionary psychological way, it's strange that you would like want to fix that because that could be like as as like a kind of a, a signal. As a, like you know, in a very vulgar like biological way, a signal like I have high testosterone. I'm a good mate. Like, but the, the the kind of technological promises of you can have a kid when you're 50, or you'll have you know a thick head of hair until you're until you're 70 or whatever. They all seem to be a kind of androgenizing. Because like you're kind of you're kind of like you're you're removing the the the, the, the like the physical and aesthetic um, signs of masculinity, and 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 you're removing the physical. An aesthetic well maybe not signs of femininity well in a way maybe, maybe you are because you're postponing like uh, uh you, you're kind of deferring your um uh reproductive capacity indefinitely so there is an androgen an androgenization which is going on there well i mean for for better or for worse as well i think there is i think there's an, like an aesthetic access uh aesthetic um aspect to this but i also think that the economic aspect is kind of important as well because you know from when this is starting to become a phenomenon in the early 1970s that is when you start seeing the fruits of um women in the workforce pretty much and increased increased numbers of women in the workforce and basically as a result of that what you have is you have uh, women who are more financially independent um and like i said for for better or for worse that has psych like psychologically made more women involuntarily childless because there are less viable men as a result. Because, you know, in terms of finances, like women date up. Yeah. True. I like, so what is to be done as Lenin once said? <laughs> well, this, is, this is the thing. And it's like I said, this is why I said for better or for worse, because there's a like a liberatory aspect to that. You say, like, well, you know, women are fi financially independent, therefore, you know, in lots of ways they are, they're independent, it makes them independent in other ways, you know, but um, there are always consequences to these things. And, you know, it's, it's kind of like the real question is like, you know, like we're in a strange paradigm where, the liberal answer always seems like the right one. And um, as unsavory as it seems to the current zeitgeist, um, we never kind of consider the more authoritarian answer, you know? Yeah, but like, but like this, is, this is a really good example of like, you know, where you don't have to be authoritarian for the sake of it or because you like it or something. But like, there's this is like a good example of one of those things where it's like, we can't con continue the liberal paradigm because if we do it, we're fucked. You know what I mean? It's it's the same thing with with uh, biotechnology. It's like you can't just have people like 
uh, uh, altering the genes of their of their children to make them more intelligent or something like do you realize what you're doing like you know the, the, like the hubris of it's ridiculous like where you kind of have to call you have to kind of pull the the emergency break on the um on, on the train of liberal progress basically <laughs> this is a really good example this is a kind of almost like a uh a hauntological point mm -hmm. mark fisher and uh because uh, mark fisher wrote about that film and i can't remember the name of it but it's got clive owen as the main actor oh children of men yeah i was gonna that's in my notes yeah i was gonna bring that up yeah and um uh, it's like a fertility crisis anyway and that's the theme of the book and so i was thinking about like the era that like mark one of the more things mark fisher would always talk about is like there's no new original music so from the 60s 70s 80s 90s there was all kind of like very original sounding music and then something happened in like the, the 2000s there was still good music i think the good music really stopped in like the 2010s but it's still good music but it was like well it was uh, there was noticeably less original it was a kind of a 90s take two and there was never really a there was never really a, a step out of that but um it 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 just kind of reminded me of like the the really phenomenological aspect to like reproducing and there's a, a theme in in Nietzsche because I'm, I'm I'm going through Zarathustra right now and one of the things he says in the section on marriage and children is he says don't just propagate forward propagate upward mm -hmm. so when you're having when we're making something and in producing a, a, a child uh, is similar to producing a song or a book or a building, you know what I mean? It's, it's like, obviously it's different, but, but it's, th there's sort of a qualitative, there's a desire for like a qualitative dif uh, um, significance to the thing and not just a quantitative one. So whenever, whenever we're talking about like reproduction problems, we're always talking about like, Oh no, there's less people. And like I do, I do agree in the demo, in, the, in the aging problem. That's a huge thing. But in terms of there just simply being less people, I sometimes do hit back and go, "Well, does it matter to less people? I mean, there was less people in the year, like you know, in ancient Greece than there probably was in Greece today. Actually, I think there might actually be a similar amount. Like Google this like last, last week. But whatever. Let's just say there wasn't. Um, it's like the people in ancient Greece were qualitatively a lot better than the people in modern Greece. Sorry, sorry if you're if you're a modern Greek, but you know so um there's a kind of you know so when people are choosing for some strange reason and i know that there's a lot of economic factors but there's also this kind of almost spiritual factor of like they're choosing not to procreate and i do wonder if it's if it's there's a little bit of a hauntological or a kind of nietzschean last man problem of like i can't imagine a qualitative production you know what i mean like i'm just doing it because there's less people and like this is just, you know, child one, child two. There isn't, there isn't this kind of qualitative sense. And then I kind of wonder about, like, as you were saying before, with um, with women dating upwards financially. And I'm like, I'm not judging anybody, right? But if we continue to, like, replace, and I think dating, you know, social media is just such a bad thing. If we continue to, like, replace, like there's a big difference between those who might provide economically with the right conditions for child rearing. And I want you to literally make something in me, which I'm going to like reproduce. And it's like, same thing with a man. It's like, you know, you're picking a, what you're picking someone you're like, I, I'm literally picking someone that I want to like reproduce a living fucking being with, you know what I mean? Like there's like, I fear that like, like with, with, with too much motivation around money, too much social media, then if you get into biotechnics, like, you know, you're reproducing in a completely artificial way. We're just going to pick genes. And blah, blah. Like, there's a kind of a lack of a kind of spiritual qualitative um, um, desire to produce, as well as just like the kind of bio, the, the kind of demographic and economic problems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's abundantly clear, this is to get onto some spicy moral questions, is that what works well reproductively, particularly in the modern world, is not necessarily the, like you would say, you would say qualitative, but it's basically, is not like necessarily the eugenic choice, you know? And like it's, it doesn't yeah. tend itself to um, trending upwards as opposed to just trend, trending across or down. And um, I mean, Nick Land describes, um, he describes urban centers as um, IQ shredders. 
which is quite interesting. I guess the is kind of the kind of theory is that um, you know you have rural areas and you have urban areas, and urban areas um, in terms of people emig- like moving to urban areas or emigrating to different countries um, attract people generally speaking with you know the higher IQ. So this is why you get the phenomenon of brain drain. And also the um, lifestyles that come with being in urban centers and um, the lifestyles that come with being an emigre are generally going to produce either no children or less children, whereas rural lifestyles are going to produce um, much larger families. Therefore, equals urban centers like IQ shredders, which is quite interesting, I think. But I don't know, which, do you think, which way do you think humanity is trending? Do you think... We're following the Nietzschean path and we're trending upwards or? Um, like, I don't know. It's hard to say. I, I like, I definitely agree that like, if, if I look at dating apps, I think to myself, like you're basically, for example, replacing like a real human being with like a, with like a few pictures and like some biographical information, almost like a CV. And I just think like, like you can't we like, and I think like, people marrying for money for example is, is another is another which which is which goes back a lot further than our fucking generation but like you know it's another problem where it's like there's this there's this trade-off between like the kind of social conditions and the sense of status and symbolic success and that and this is a very very Nietzschean point can be in contrast with the actual like kind of more qualitative and like when I say qualitative I don't just mean in the biological sense I also mean in that kind of in, in, in like in a more vague sense of just like uh you know that kind of x factor that someone might have or like um, um yeah so uh, have you seen a film um uh what the fuck is called I can't remember what it's fucking called now I talked about it with with Josh Johansson when we did a conversation uh like last year but it, it it's it's a uh, Gattaca that's it it's like a film about biotechnically creating great people whatever like uh, perfect people and there's two there's two brothers in it and the, uh, the main character is not biogenically enhanced and he always has this kind of rivalry with his biogenically enhanced brother and they have this like swimming competition once a year and he always wins the swimming competition and the biogenically enhanced brother says like how do you beat me i'm enhanced and he says i don't think about the journey home and you do like i give it all and you don't so there's this kind of like spiritual qualitative like grit or tenacity to people that that like a world which is just too much you know like reduced to numbers and symbols and quantities and 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 and, 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 and like corporate positions or academic credentials just doesn't have you know and it's like this real like beauty and like real like spirit which I think just makes us want to be with each other and like maybe reproduce as well is another part of that. So if we don't have that, uh, it's not that surprising to me that people are going to be like, well, I'm rich, but I just don't feel ready to have children. <laughs> you know, well, all these fucking third world countries have loads of kids and they're not rich at all. So, I mean, yeah, Evela talks about the uh, quantitative versus the qualitative stuff. Um, mm-hmm. Like in his model, we're currently living in what's called the reign of plenty. Or the, sorry, the reign of quantity, sorry, the reign of quantity. Um mm-hmm. Which means that things are all about, you know, um, instrumentalized um, quantity as opposed to anything um, deontological, like you're talking about, anything to do with spirit or that sort of stuff. It's all it's all to do with um, anything you can quantify utilitarian in a utilitarian sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, like, I think we have the problems with both the deontological. Uh, the, 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 the kind of the, the the ignorance of you know the spiritual and the and the deontological but and you also have the more practical problems as you were saying of like brain drain of like someone being biologically you know like rich people aren't necessarily like biologically the you know the best people to reproduce with like you have all of these conflicts basically i think which are going on which like don't really motivate <laughs> hmm. um qualitative reproduction of any sort basically you know and i think this is this is this is a really really bad problem which we haven't really taken seriously yeah um 
but kind of get to get back to the kind of population collapse point is that I'm also not convinced that it's like the world ending scenario that the documentary seems to want to tilt you towards, you know? Um, yeah. I mean, just to give some examples from population lulls and kind of collapses, disasters in like European history, like after the, the you know, the collapse of the Roman empire, there was a huge decline um, and then a stable lull through the lower middle ages um, into a, a boom in the higher middle ages, which would have been, you know, from like the year 1000 for like the next couple hundred years. Um, and then you have like long periods of stability and then declines until you get to the Renaissance. And then all of this is punctuated with collapses of famine um, and collapses of, you know, like the plague spreading through Europe, which, you know, at the time, if you lived through it, it would seem like the world was ending, you know, like one in three people dying at the time. Yeah. But, you know, ultimately humanity survived at the end of the day. And ultimately European civilization survived as well. Um, I think, the, and it's quite funny, the chap who made this film, Stephen Shaw, it's funny that he's in that age range, but I feel like this film is very scary for people in that generation who've lived to a certain level of comfort in their lives, but are also expecting a certain like certain handouts and certain level of comfort when they get to an older age. And are also, you know, expecting things like the continued and never ending um, growth of the housing market, for example. Mm. If, we're in a, if we're in a population collapse scenario, or if we're even in a very, like a top heavy aging population scenario, um, you're going to see less of a just to give an example you're going to see less demand for um housing and you're going to see less demand for the sorts of houses that that generation live in um i think that's that those are the <laughs> those are kind of the worries that are brought up by the film i don't know if you kind of agree with that or not but that's fair yeah i think that um basically i'm not terribly worried about some of the consequences of what they're talking about I'm more depending worried on about what like, everyone social... votes for, depending on what everyone votes for. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fair. But like, I'm more worried about the social and technological consequences rather than about like literally us going extinct. Like, I don't think we're going to go extinct, obviously, but, um, but, but like, you know, I don't want to live in a society where, you know, where, where like every single government that's voted in is voted in by people in like the average age range of like 65 or 70 like <laughs> like I, I really don't want to live in that world i like i you know so but like that's more of a political social ethical problem than it is like a literal uh, like a, a literal extinction problem you know um so yeah i would say i would agree with the alarmism in the sense that if they just think economically and i do think also that there's a bit of like um alarmism which even in, in the COVID eras, I think the the, the, the the COVID years were very symbolic of like the end of that post-war technocratic period of like um, indefinite growth, indefinite progress, indefinite, indefinite personal liberation and so on. I feel like um, the, the, the past few years have been basically like the, the kind of limit of that. And now we're having to go in a different direction. And I think that there's also kind of a political catastrophism, which expresses itself as being cosmological like we're all gonna die like trump's gonna put us all in a gulag or like you know it's something like, but it's like no it's just the end of an era of, and, and like your particular your generations like especially the boomers and maybe the gen xers too um your kind of particular vision of the future in the world is is is, is ending and you're conflating that ideological projection with like you know the cosmological bio, or biological survival of, of us all or something you know mm -hmm. but that's fair I, so i basically agree with you on that point yeah uh -huh. i think what's more interesting is there are a bunch of things which kind of make it seem like and it's, it's weird because i always thought that the the birth rate thing was going to be limited to what is they like largely called the western world but it turns out that that's still actually true. And this is a worldwide thing 
apart from sub-Saharan Africa. I'm not sure why you think it's not sub-Saharan Africa, but um, basically, it seems it seems like that will to I, I think it would be the Schopenhauerian will to live, which is basically the will to reproduction, which is how the will of nature in Schopenhauer's language expresses itself through the idea of man. So if you are definitely using his language there, but that will has kind of been dissipated in strange ways. I mean, I mean, if you have older parents who are having less children, then, you know, children become more pr like precious. And like that film we already mentioned, Children of Men, like children become a very, very precious thing. But also that has the um, consequence of making them incredibly coddled, basically. Um, yeah. <laughs> along with the fact that, you know, people are becoming dog dog parents or pet parents, you know? It's going to be like some sort of weird, perverse suicide, like, that's going on. Mm. I'm not sure what you make of that. But that's what that, I that all makes perfect sense to me. I think, yeah, like the, beyond the the technology and the economics, there's there is some sort of nihilism. I think that's that's there. Um, like antinatalism is a good example of that, um, and that's something which expresses itself not in some rational concern for demographic shifts over time or something or changes in the economy, but just like like a pure like just moral outrage at the recreation of life at least that's whenever i've spoken to antinatalists that's the impression i've gotten anyway but um the environmental catastrophism i think is similar um i'm not saying there isn't any sort of environmental crisis or like problems but but like the the way it's framed and so on yeah yeah 100 percent. there's a there's a lack of concern for the future for future generations there's a lack of wool you know yeah, um, it, it does remind me a little bit of like um, uh, this uh, point about the end of history being the end of geography, which Paul really makes, where it's like we don't kind of existentially feel like there's anything more to expand on and to conquer and to grow towards. So we start to retreat inwards. You know, we start to we start to uh, adapt ourselves to being less to like taking up less room and so on. And, 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 uh, um, you know, even the kind of rhetoric around, I think kind of progressive technocratic control over the past, you know, decade or so has been very much like, ooh, like toxic, like toxic masculinity. It's like, it's an environmental issue. It's like poisoning, you know? Um, uh, so yeah, yeah. Like there's, definitely an ideological turn towards like um away from expansion and uh, growth and towards like towards like uh, I, I don't know how exactly to describe it i would say like an, an ecology of shrinkage an ecology of like self hatred even maybe to an extent why why does it exclude sub-saharan africa uh because they just they just don't fucking watch the news <laughs> it is like i feel like they just like they, <laughs> they, it's, it's, they don't have twitter in sub-saharan africa Therefore, i just feel like they just, they just ignore what everyone else is doing like everyone else in the world is trying to be all modern and they're just like nah we'll just fucking do our kind thing. of kind of based but like i was also thinking about that like, like on like on the level of like they have so much space sure you know, like they just live in a world where it's like if you go that way, it's this massive desert. If you go that way, it's this massive mountain range. And like it could be in a big city, but like if you go that way, you're gonna go into like a, a, a um, savanna full of giant animals that can kill you. It just kind of feels like a little bit like like they must feel a little bit like they're living like in kind of a more uh, uh, just kind of more primordially intimate times. Where if you go like to Europe, it's like there's no fucking wild animals. There's nowhere really to expand on, you know um i'd like i don't know <laughs> it's an interesting question do you know that um when mal was talking to kissinger in the 1970s um he offered to trade the usa 10 million women really that's <laughs> I, amazing i feel oh, so this is like a recorded phone like a phone call i think he was joking uh, yeah okay 
But I love the thought of like, you know, loads of grain being sent to the starving Chinese Communist government and then <laughs> sending some of their population over to the US. Did they have, this is, this is another interesting topic is, is like kind of mass, yeah, like demographic shifts through mass migration and stuff. But it, 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 did, did they have excessive women at the time? Like in Russia, for example, after World War II, they had, they had like way more women than they had men. I, I believe so. I mean, um, yeah, I think the the great leap forward years were particularly br brutal for men. Um, but yeah, I guess you know that's that was kind of the spirit of that age. You know, you had Nixon talking about overpopulation. You know, that was the big issue for China before they introduced the one child policy. Um, now, now China's got one of the biggest birth gaps. In the world, I believe. I think it's like um, they're at like 1.7, which is two is the replacement rate, basically. Um, and they have way more men than women, right? And they have way more men than women as a result of the one child policy, um, you know, where you have elective abortions for when they find out it's going to be a, like yeah. a girl yeah. or they, you know, go up to the mountains and ditch their, their child, which is. Um, Pretty, pretty dark stuff yeah um yeah no like it, it, it's funny how like it it what always strikes me is it's funny how unthoughtful modern governments are when it comes to these demographic changes like you would that would like you know like an eight-year-old could kind of sit around and think about this for a few minutes and go and go hold on if you pick a one child rule instead of even just a two child rule one child rule this is going to happen like so um it's, it's... Well, I mean, one of the one of the mistakes that the western world makes is they assume that the rest of the world thinks in the same way as them yeah yeah but i mean even if you were thinking from like the chinese perspective like we, we want a son you know like it would make sense if you impose a one child rule that people would end up aborting the girl right yeah i mean it's and it's you know it's, I, I believe it's becoming a thing in Pakistan and India where, you know, it's more, it's preferable to have a, at least a boy, boy is the first child. Yeah. And there is an increase in elective abortions once they find out that it's going to be a girl, which is quite sad. Um, I actually yeah. looked into, because I was just interested, I was like wondering um, whether the Hermit Kingdom, whether North Korea had this problem or not. Um, North Korea is like trying to get their population to have as many kids as possible but they're still at like 1.91 so they're still below the tipping point mm. i thought of all the places that would be where they'd be you know lining people up and forcing them to have children or something like that but turns out not the other sorry like i think the demographic shifts is like the other crazy thing that's going to happen in the next few years is um so like okay there's two there's, well, there's two things right like that whole, whole no, see because you mentioned africa like that whole north african region in particular some of the middle east but maybe north africa they're going to have like a massive excess of people that everywhere else is going to be on the decline so uh so you have these kind of um immigration problems in a lot of european countries at the moment and like, you know, it's, it, it is true that like a lot of them are young men. It makes sense because the journey is a bit dangerous. The, the government is looking for workers as well. So like, it's not looking for people that, that it wants to have to take care with the uh, with welfare. So it's not going to look for old people and children and so on. But like, you're going to have these massive like demographic shifts that, that are going to happen. Because if you let in like 10,000 people and like, they're like 80% male, like where are the women for them to marry? in the mm -hmm. country they get to you know it's like like I, I walk around even here where i am in ireland i like see so many uh uh migrants that are like men and i'm just like who are you people gonna marry <laughs> like you know what i mean like who are you people gonna be with like um so like there's almost gonna be like a, like a, like a class of people it looks like that are sexless mm -hmm. you know like don't have mates i mean and, there's always, so this is the thing is there's always been sexless, sexless men, sorry. There's always been sexless men. That's just something that is true in our history. What makes the birth gap phenomenon important is that there is an increase in childless women. 
um, you know, it could be as a result of what you're saying, you know, like, I mean, it's, it's um, I've seen a lot, like some uh, like TikTokers and stuff, like who are men who are, you know, in the kind of manosphere of like pickup artists sort of stuff, but they're kind of like saying, oh, I, I moved to like Vietnam or whatever, and there's loads of women here and all that sort of stuff, you know? Um, yeah. So what you're saying might be right, you know? Like there might be a complete mismatch and that might be the cause of it. Um, but I do think, yeah, the, the birth gap thing is very, very strange because contrary to what people who think that rape is norm normalized would say to you, um, women actually do the, the sexual selection. Um, and what is very abnormal about this phenomenon since the seventies is that um, like, you know, even like usually there's usually there's an option for women basically, but it seems like the increase in childless women means that there isn't an option for them anymore, which is unique. Wait, so the, the increase in childless women means there isn't an option for them. How does that make sense? I don't. Yeah, exactly. This is what I mean. So, I mean, that's that's what makes the last um, 40, 50 years unique is that there, you know, like I said, there's always been sexless men. That's just a fact. And what makes this situation unique is that there are childless women as opposed to just childless men. Okay, okay. So there either isn't an option for some women. Like you said, there might be, you know, movements in demographics that make that, you know, not possible, or they are electing to not have children at all for whatever reason. Hmm. Yeah, it it, it 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 is a mystery. But like, okay, so if you get really spicy, because <laughs> I think the part of this problem is the overemphasis on like personal choice. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, for example, how how for how long in human history were like women basically and like? And I think it's I think it's I think it's exaggerated how little choice. You know, it, it, if you, like, for example, I had, I had a teacher in school who was, like, old enough, and he was from, like, rural Ireland, and he had an arranged marriage, right? And, like, we used to kind of, like, as, as soon as people heard about this, we all thought well, it was really funny, and we were like, ah, that's funny. Like, like, we were all, like, joking about how miserable their marriage must be. But, uh, but like, I would imagine it's, an, it's arranged, but you kind of get a choice of, like, a certain amount of people, but it's still arranged. You know what I mean? So it's like if your friends are trying to hook you up with someone, they're not going to go. You're going to you're going you're gonna to be out, going out with this person. I've decided it. They're like they're kind. I know your. I know like traditional parents are a bit, are a bit more authoritative than your friends, right? But still, you know what I mean. It's still their child, and they still don't want them to be absolutely miserable. So they're going to be like, okay, look, we'll we'll help mediate this um, thing. He's a, he's a good lad. You know what I mean? So, uh, like. Uh, and then she goes, no, nah, I don't want him at all. Okay, fair enough. Well, he's a good lad. Well, he's a better. You know, like. Like, I feel if you remove any sort of social, like, authority, which is, like, which is like pushing women, they're just not going to choose. They're just, they're just not going to choose people. And I think that that's, 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 that's literally just, like, an evident fact to me. And even when I was younger, like, pre-dating app world and so on, and I know, I know this, this childless women problem is going back to the 70s and so on, but I do think that there's, like, an excess in, like, single people today. So like people were not necessarily excessively single in the seventies and eighties and nineties, but they were not having kids, right? But like now it's they're not having kids and there's an excess of single people. And I think a part of the problem is like you even used to have like friend groups, even when the parents or the the aunts and uncles went away from setting people people up, your friends would set people up. And then you get further and further into like this complete, like, well, you can choose anything you want. You've got an app, you can go over here, you can do this. And like, there's no kind of social mediation and no pressure. And I think that maybe for men, this is okay. They can sort of like make, they can just sort of uh, like make their choices or whatever. But like, I definitely just don't, don't I, I definitely think for women, like most of them need like to be kind of pushed into it a little bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> one, well, one thing, to, one thing to remember as well is that the whole concept of dating is, um, not just like a, it's pretty it's a pretty western concept but it's also a very yeah. modern concept like for you to autonomously go and take your pick of the litter and then you know then there's all these um these this social dance that happens like oh three dates means this or five dates means this and all that sort of bullshit um yeah. 
there's this all this social layering and i mean anyone who's been um you know you go to the supermarket and you're like oh i need to buy uh cereal right and you're like okay i need to buy cereal but then you're confronted by an entire aisle of different options and mm. it's much more difficult to choose when you have that many options as opposed to if you just have one two three or just one maybe yeah. you know um so I don't know. Maybe it's maybe it's like um, is, is also that, it's it's weird because you know, like you said, you know, like we're all we're all connected and we're all connected instantly and we're all connected on an incredibly granular le granular level. Maybe it's the variety that is the issue. You know, I mean, like you know, let to take it to give like an example, like if you if you meet someone in person and you click with them in whatever way. And then later on, you find out, oh, this person doesn't make as much money as me. Then, you know, then that doesn't immediately exclude them from the dating pool. But if you have a filter and it's a database that you search, which is literally what <laughs> is literally a database yeah. and you have a hard cut off, you're not even going to have that first introduction to that person. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's interesting, I think. Yeah, 100%. And also, I think that the, the, the social support systems people aren't supportive of each other anymore like people used to kind of help each other out if, if someone was single or something or they just like you know the they would kind of be supportive and they would you know they would kind of say oh is your friends you know like they would kind of help each other out back in the day but like i feel now nowadays with social media everyone's just in competition with each other like have you, i somebody made a meme about it and i can't tell you how many fucking times i've seen this in real life or happened to me in real life where it's like people are at like a party or like at a nightclub or a pub or whatever. And a guy starts talking to a girl and her friend comes up and goes, hey, excuse me. And just like drags the friend away. And it's like, your friend Katie was talking to this person and they were fine with it. Why are you doing this? Like, but, but that's just the kind of nature of like modern friendships. Like, like they're kind of, they're not supportive. Like they're, they're in competition with each other the whole time. They're looking at each other on social media. You've got more followers than me. You've got more matches than me. You're doing this. And, there isn't that same sense of solidarity and support, which uh, which maybe I'm romanticizing it a bit. I'm, I'm sure people are always competing with each other, even even in very traditional societies. But I really feel like it's taken off to a, to like a next level kind of shit, you know. Mm -hmm. But and that's not helpful either. So, so I yeah I don't know about you. I I thought I thought the film was pretty good. I think it's worth a watch. Although I kind of stick to the conclusion that it's more of a it's more of a horror film for Gen Xs and Boomers than it is for anyone else. Um, I don't know if you have anything else you want to add, but yeah, I recommend people watch it. And if you want to pay for an annual subscription to their thing, then go for it. But I didn't do that. Yeah. So. No, it's, it's definitely worth watching. And it's definitely an issue which is going to become more and more of an issue as time goes by. Um, it's like I can't see any solutions or any remedies to the problem. And it's, it's one of those really important issues because it's going to basically undermine everything we have assumed about, as, as we were saying earlier, about liberal, individual, personal freedom and all that stuff. So, hmm. yeah. The incel um, authoritarian government is coming. And you better, <laughs> he's going to have to accept that. <laughs> You're going <laughs> to screw to save the world.